Our generation is watching the death of marriage and the family as we know it. Among the many factors contributing to its destructions are immorality, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, abortion, sterilization, women's liberation, delinquency, and sexual rebellion. All those things like strands in the cord that is strangling the family. There are many opinions about the restructuring of the family. Some sociologists say marriages need to change. They say we need to open marriages or non-marriages. And that it really doesn't matter whether marriage continues as they have in the past. People are grouping without any base authority to try to find out how to make meaningful relationships in a disintegrating society. It's time for Christians to reiterate the divine pattern. Our marriages and families should demonstrate a way of living that is rewarding, meaningful and fulfilling. That divine pattern should be evident to the world as it looks at Christian marriages and families. Unfortunately, the world's problems of divorce has also become a problem of the church. But God has the divine standard that can make marriage and the family what they ought to be. Pastor John Mark Arthur has this to say. <laughs> this big emphasis on marriage, how to have a happy marriage, how to have a happy home. Most of it is built on selfishness. Most of it is built on the wrong perspective. For example, the typical marriage seminar. The typical marriage seminar, they tell the husband this, you want to have a happy marriage? Listen to your wife. Want to have a happy marriage? Be kind to your wife, be sensitive to your wife, be gentle with your wife, bring her flowers, take her out for dinner. If you want to really have a happy marriage, meet her what? Her needs. We're back to that need mentality again. Meet her needs. She's got a lot of needs and you need to meet her needs. Very important. And so here's this husband. And he's doing everything he can think of to try to meet her needs. Well, I've got to stay home because that's my, 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 I just have to meet my needs right. Well, I need to get this for her and take this. I want to really meet her needs. And what he's telling her is this, you know what marriage is? Marriage is where you get all your needs met. Marriage is where I knock myself silly trying to meet all your needs all the time. That's what marriage is. That's what she's programmed to believe. Same thing on the flip flop. They tell the wife, now if you want to really have a happy marriage, meet your husband's needs. Look pretty when he comes home. Don't have your hair done up in coils like explosion in a mattress factory. Be dressed. Get your makeup on. Look nice. You know, once in a while have a candlelight dinner and the kids down the street. I mean, you've got to, you've got to meet his knees. And when he comes in the house, don't say, I'm sick of going out the back door. I went out the back door five times a day and I walked by the same weeds that have been there eight years. Would you please pull the weeds? Don't, don't be more sensitive than that. He's had a hard day. Meet his needs. Be sensitive. Listen to him. Make a haven for him. I mean, you just begin to play manipulation games. The, the most popular book out now on this has an interesting suggestion. It suggests that a husband who really wants to, really wants to, to touch his wife significantly should go to the store and buy a teddy bear, stuffed teddy bear. Bring it home, wrap it in tin foil and freeze it. Now before you do that, you write a love note, stick it under the little ribbon of the teddy bear's neck. And then wrap it in tin foil, freeze it and stick it back in the back of the refrigerator where the old lasagna goes you know, or the old spaghetti or the old whatever, leftovers. And you just leave it there. Now, she doesn't know it's there, but some night when she's got to quickly prepare dinner and she reaches back for the old lasagna and unwraps this deal, here is a frozen teddy bear with a love note. Now, honestly, folks, I mean, we're all adults here, right? My response to that is, if you have a good marriage, you don't need the teddy bear. Save the money. If you have a bad one, she'll hit you with it, so you better be careful. <laughs> It'd be better if it wasn't frozen. <laughs> but the bottom line, um, the most popular book, that same book, has a section called Pillars That Support a Fulfilling Marriage. 
security, communication, emotion, romance, touch, and intimacy. The pillars that support a marriage, security, communication, emotion, touch, and intimacy. Those are nice things. It's nice to have security. It's nice to have communication. It's nice to have emotion or romance. It's nice to touch each other. It's nice to have some kind of intimacy. But those things aren't going to keep a marriage together. They aren't going to do it. The same book says the best way we know to bond in a family is by going camping. You know how many times I've taken my family camping? Zero. <laughs> The best way to bond in a family is by going camping? What does that mean? Pretty shallow stuff. And then the book says, if a woman truly wants to have a meaningful con a communication with her husband, she must activate the right side of his brain. <laughs> now there it is, lady, in black and white. If, it, if your marriage isn't working, you've got to activate the right side of his brain. We're back to this manipulation. We're back to this needs mentality, which is such a counterproductive focus where everybody is concerned about having their needs met. You know the problem with that? If that woman is programmed to believe marriage is where all her needs are met, the truth of the matter is there isn't a man on earth who can meet them all. And so as soon as she finds that they're not getting met, she feels justified in the fact that she's noticed somebody else who might be able to do it better. And divorce is an option. And the same with the guy. If he thinks marriage is supposed to be where all his needs are met, it's obvious that she's not going to meet them all. She's even going to understand them all. Then he's going to be justified in the fact that his needs aren't being met. She is not what I need. You hear them say, and off he goes and justifies another relationship. And it works that way even with the children. You know, they say, well, make sure you're sensitive and listen to your children and give them some space and meet their needs. You can really alienate yourself from everybody in your house by programming them to believe that you are this incessant need meter. How do you keep a marriage together? by focusing on something completely outside those relationships. It's a given that you're married. Somebody said, you know, to me one time, well, I married the wrong woman. My response was, well, she's the right one now. And now that we've got that established, how are we going to make this thing work? But you've got to transcend that relationship. Some relationships are better than others. Some are more fulfilling than others on a human plane. But none of them will be all that God designed them to be unless the people are living outside themselves for a greater cause. And that is particularly true in the spiritual dimension. Divorce is no option for me. Why? Not because my wife meets all my needs all the time. I don't even tell her all my needs. There's anybody in the world who's going to always know all the needs of someone else. Our marriage doesn't work because I all the time meet all her needs. I don't think she even expects that. I don't expect that. But our marriage works and divorce is no option for us because we have a cause beyond ourselves for which we live. What is that? We live to the glory of God. We live to the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Divorce is not an option. Why? Because we have a testimony before the community in which we live to show them the power of Christ in a home. Divorce is not an option because our home is to be a haven for Christian people to come and to see the work of the Spirit of God. Conflict isn't even an option. Selfishness isn't even an option because our home is exposed to so many people and we want Christ to be seen. So the agenda for us is not make sure I meet all your needs, but the agenda for us is make sure I walk in the Spirit. And I find that if I live to the glory of Christ walking in the Spirit, I have a wonderful marriage and a wonderful family life. It's been a very, very significant curiosity to me that in the same 20 years that the divorce rate in the church has gone from something like 500 to 1 to the same as the divorce rate in the world, in that same time of decline in marriage has been an escalation of material on marriage. The only thing that I can conclude is some of this stuff is putting gasoline on a fire because the focus is wrong. 
get outside yourself. That's not popular in the day in which we live. If somebody comes in and says, I have this problem, I have that problem, I have this problem, and our marriages are working out, the first question you might want to ask them is, well, tell me about your spiritual life. Tell me about your spiritual service. Are the two of you walking in the Spirit and are you serving Christ with all your heart? Because you see, if you're lost in the spiritual issues and you're lost in the advancement of the kingdom, it seems to me that God would grant you the grace of joy in your marriage. 